Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony, and joining me is King of the Gnostics, Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Hello. Your Majesty. <laughs> Hello, Father Tony. It's great to be back for sort of the, really the true launch of season six. Yes. Um, because we uh, we did have a, a show um, last month, but uh, it was uh, it was secretly a banked show. So this, this yeah. is really, truly the... Uh, the uh, season six, and I can't believe we've been doing this since since 2012. A better time, a purer time. The yeah. air was fresher. The water yeah. tasted. The gentleman, 2012 would be looked back on as the good old days. I don't believe <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so the voice you heard is Mitch Horowitz, uh, author and uh, occult expert. And welcome back to the Gnostic Wisdom Network. Mitch, it's great to have you back. Thank you. Good to be here. So uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, you are uh, you are the author of a couple of very interesting books. One I recommend to everybody, Occult America. Um, fantastic book and really interesting uh, history of the uh, kind of occult traditions that made America uh, interesting in its early formation. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't read that, everybody go check that out. Um, and uh, also recently a uh, book on new thought and positive thinking. And so I think we're going to um, kind of mix all of that in a big bag together and uh, okay. see what comes out. So cool. uh, Jonathan, would you like to begin with our first question? Yes, of course. Um, uh, Mitch, how do you define the occult? I define the occult very simply as an unseen dimension of life whose forces can be felt on us and through us. It's a radically ecumenical spirituality, and by spirituality, I'm really just simply referencing extra physical forces. Uh, the term occult comes from the Latin occultus or occultum, which simply means hidden or secret. It was a term adopted during the Renaissance by religious thinkers and scholars and translators who were looking for a way to reference the religious ideas of the ancient world. Uh, the mystery religions, the esoteric traditions of Greece, Rome, Egypt in particular. And uh, they settled on this word secret or uh, occultum just because these were traditions that had once been above ground religious movements associated with governments and temple orders and all those things had vanished uh, as late antiquity degraded into what we sometimes call the Dark Ages. And so during the Renaissance, seekers and thinkers were rediscovering these things for the first time, and they, they did indeed see them as a sacred, hidden, primeval spirituality. And that Latin term, occultus, became our English term, occult, and started to come into use in the 1500s. So it doesn't mean anything uh, sinister or forbidding or anything that I think any reasonable person should be frightened of. It's a part of our tradition. It's the primeval theology that our world is built on. Yeah. What, uh, I think we're actually going to title the show Practical Esotericism with, with Mitch Horowitz. So I'm going to try to keep that, that focus because I, I'm quite guilty of this. Believe it or not, maybe you can take a look at me. I, I'm a bit nerdy. I'm a bit geeky, right? So I'm not accepted. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I know I look like sort of a uh, typical muscled Adonis, but the truth of the matter is I, like glasses, I, could... I have to say you're <laughs> impeccable. <laughs> but uh, so so I could sit down and, and I could talk about, you know, Spider-Man continuity for, for a good three hours. And yeah. I could do the same thing with, I don't know, patterns of emanations in the Nagamati library, right? Yeah. Like, I, I can really get lost um, in the minutia and in all the interesting ideas and concepts that are in the occult or in Gnosticism, in esoteric thought. But what, what idea or philosophy do you see in the occult that's particularly life-changing, that, that you see as kind of practically altering, you know, your life, other people's lives? Yeah. It seems to me that the central keynote of occult thought and this was found in antiquity, particularly within what is called Hermeticism, the late ancient Greek-Egyptian magical philosophy that was attributed to the mythical man-god Hermes Trismegistus. This is present in Egyptian antiquity. This is present in the flowering of occult experimentation during the Renaissance, and it's present in our own modern era. It's 
to my mind, the keynote of occult thought, and it's simply this. Thoughts are causative. Your mind makes things happen. There are extra physical properties to life. They aren't the only properties under which we live. But the mind is a participant in the concretizing of ideas, pictures, images, and there are lots of other laws and forces that we live under as well. We live under physical laws. Mortality alone tells us that. The mind may be the ultimate arbiter of what we experience, but there are all kinds of interceding forces. So far as gravity is a consistent law, be a law, something must be consistent, you're going to experience gravity very differently if you're on the moon versus on the planet Jupiter. Likewise, you're going to yeah. experience the effect of mind very differently based on all kinds of circumstances. But my contention is that that central principle and concept of occult thought, which can be found in an interrupted thread, these things aren't family trees, they're jagged, they're interrupted, they take byways, sometimes they disappear and are just rediscovered by a future generation, but you can find a jagged thread extending back to ancient Egypt, particularly in the decades immediately following Christ as Hermetic thought flowered up, that you can follow up to our alternative spiritual subculture today, including the rebirth of Gnosticism, which you guys participate in magnificently. Yeah. This notion that the mind is an agency of causation is probably the central theme of occult thought. And when you engage in magic and spell work and chaos magic, ceremonial magic, in many ways what you're doing is augmenting that spiritual principle, that non-physical principle. It also underscores our self-help culture, the power of positive thinking, the secret, the law of attraction. They're dealing with this same idea. A chaos magician and some guy who goes to Joel Osteen's prosperity ministry on Sunday morning is they are to a very great extent with vastly different cultural touchstones functioning on the grounds of the same foundational principle which is yeah. that what you think affects what happens to you that's the central occult idea and it's permeated the root work of our civilization you find it within mainstream evangelical Christianity you find it within chaos magic, ceremonial magic, occultism, you find it within uh, new thought and motivational philosophies. I've called it the American creed in the sense that it has so permeated the groundwater of Western life, we don't even know it's there, but it's present everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned new thought, you mentioned um, the secret and power of positive thinking and a number of other um, philosophies. Uh, do, could you... If you had to pick one, what do, you, what do you think is the most important philosophy, the most life-changing philosophy of, of the occult? Well, I'm in transition right now myself in that regard, so that's a very interesting question for me today. I would have told you six months ago that the answer is New Thought, because New Thought is a magical system based in scriptural ethics, and I've often observed, at least in the recent past, that scriptural ethics, or some kind of guardrails from some ancient, hallowed, classical, ethical, religious tradition, whether Taoism or Hinduism or Buddhism, the Tao Te Ching, the Bhagavad Gita, what have you, any, any, any sacred tradition can provide ethical guardrails. And I've always felt that when you're working with magic, that's very necessary. And New Thought for me has been a very satisfying commitment because it's steeped in scriptural or gospel ethics. And so... Up until very recently, I probably would have identified New Thought as central to my life, and it still is. It still is. But I recently have come to terms with the fact that I think what people are seeking in most spiritualities is some sense of personal agency, some sense of personal power. So I, I've gotten more interested in counter traditions uh, to Scripture. I've gotten more interested at the moment, and I think going forward, in traditions that are identified with the left-hand path. I think, for example, the term Satanism is the great boogeyman that exists on the occult, but it's a misunderstood term insofar as the occult is a misunderstood term. There's a counter-tradition and a counter-history that can be read into 
our Western religious myths and ideas and parables that does not necessarily comport with the traditional ethical story that comes out of scripture, and yet that I think is not in itself violent or harmful or disrespecting of other individuals. And I'm interested in exploring that as well, because I think that it's uniquely important on the spiritual path to come to terms with exactly what you're looking for. And I think, frankly, a lot of people, regardless of what they call their philosophy or what prayers they say, are looking for some increased sense of personal agency or personal power through whatever extra physical influences exists. And they want to be ethical as well, and they should, and they should. But I've started to expand my search into new thought uh, somewhat outwardly, uh, like the spokes from a, from a wheel, and look into philosophies that are not necessarily scripturally based without jettisoning that either. So I'm in transition at this point. My principle, or my point of experimentation, is the statement that thoughts are causal. That's my, that's my key point of experimentation. I'm willing to take that, uh, kind of put it on my back, like a turtle shell, and go into a whole range and, 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 and variety of territories. So I don't, I don't have an immediate answer for you, you know, at the present time. Six months ago, I would have said New Thought, and I remain committed to New Thought, and I think New Thought is a wonderful, wonderful place to search within. For me personally, at this point in my life, my search, while still abiding by that core principle, has expanded outside of it. Yeah. Um, we'll kind of stay on, on that topic of new thought, uh, not, to, not to ruin people's perceptions at home or to, to pull the, the curtain aside and, and shock your minds. We actually do have a, a question sheet that we use loosely. And one of my questions <laughs> was, you know, how, how do you connect new thought to the occult? And, and I think you just did that. Yeah. But um, kind of kind of saying on that topic of positive thinking, new thought, like, uh, Mitch, like, I, I really enjoy your, your writing and your speaking. So, you know, I try to catch you whenever you're on a podcast. And it seems to me that in um, a lot of your writing, uh, a lot of your speaking, you're sort of called upon to, to defend new thought and positive yeah. thinking. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, that's just my fancy intro to have you do it yet again. But I was wondering <laughs> if you could also talk about, like, what are some of the common misperceptions? Like, why, why do people need you to defend new thought and positive thinking so much? <laughs> well, what are some of the misperceptions out there? It's sort of everybody's whipping post, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, people within the mainstream often tend to think of the positive mind gospel as being something that saps people of their political will, political energy, their ability to think about material conditions in the outer world. And then people within the occult world think of new thought or positive thinking as sort of squishy and namby-pamby, <laughs> you know, uh, the occultism of grandma's nightstand. And, you know, it doesn't seem viscerally exciting enough to them. And so, you know, kind of new thought is everybody's favorite target, even though it actually underscores everything. So, anyway, the point that I'm making is that New Thought really became the domesticated version of a whole wide variety of mystical ideas that were reborn uh, during the uh, European Renaissance, in the West at least, and, and in, in generations going forward. And it's become domesticated, and people see it as um, overly familiar, easy to challenge, unrealistic, immature, the simple man's philosophy. But my contention is this. The profundity of an idea is felt only in its application. And, you know, you can look at an idea like the golden rule and say, oh, that's so simple, you know, who cares? But if you spent your life trying to apply the golden rule, you'd be put in front of incredible questions, starting with, with the fact that you can't do it. Why? Why can't you do it? You know, we're always looking around for new philosophies, new ideas. We have philosophies and ideas. We have the Tao Te Ching. We have the Bhagavad Gita. We have the Beatitudes. We have the Dhammapada. We have all these things. And yet we cannot apply them. But we're so quick to dismiss the familiar in favor of the novel because the novel distracts us from the fact that we cannot apply them. And in trying to apply a principle, you are put up against some very tough, tough questions about human nature. But people don't try to apply a principle. 
they distract themselves either with novelty or with an ersatz seriousness. There are some spiritual journals that are so boring, I get bored just thinking about them, and they too serve to distract the individual from the application of very basic principles because they take you on a journey into all these different layers of thought which give food for contemplation, but they are basically an escape hatch from being placed in front of the question, why can't I apply the golden rule? Why can't I abstain from lying? Why can't I keep my word? Why am I not seen as trustworthy or helpful or beneficent by people around me? Why can't I abstain from an intoxicating substance that's either killing me or detracting from the nature of my existence? So I'm very, very suspicious of any kind of respectability or ersatz seriousness on the spiritual path. You're calling this show Practical Esotericism. It's practical or it's nothing. An idea is either felt in conduct or it's not a worthy idea. It's not an actionable idea. So new thought becomes a whipping post because it's so simple. People who consider themselves serious think it's, it's simplistic, childish. People who consider themselves materialist or political think that it's some sort of distraction. Um, and it's very easy to, to flee from practical ideas. Almost everyone busts on the secret, and it's almost become a sign of seriousness of <laughs> within yeah. our spiritual culture to claim that you hate the secret and you want nothing to do with such squishy ideas. Almost as if no one you know, had bought the secret. You've got 40 million people, some odd, who have bought the secret that everyone you encounter seems to hate the secret. And the truth is, <clears throat> I asked myself, you know, what is this backlash secret about, really? And about six, seven months ago, I rewatched the movie with one of my younger kids, and I liked it very much. I liked the values of it. It doesn't have the claims that people attribute to it. It's not as materialistic as people sometimes say, and that's a whole other topic, because people have very concrete material needs, and I think there's a hypocrisy again in denying or running away from that or saying that somehow doesn't belong on the spiritual path. But in any case, I watched the thing, and I liked its, I liked its values. I thought it was a good entryway to some ideas. And I suppose what I'm really saying is that I, I'm called upon to defend or explain the positive mind gospel or the new thought gospel because it it seems to detract and you know, from 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 the certainty of everyone it seems to alienate everyone materialists don't like it because it suggests that life is grounded in non-material laws uh, serious people on the path don't like it because they don't want to be associated with what they consider a new age or a therapeutic or a realistic uh, kind of philosophy of wishful thinking Everybody finds a reason to run from it. But of course, there is a vast constituency in this country who, in different forms, different ways, different vocabularies, appears to be thought. Their voices aren't necessarily held, uh, heard in the media, uh, in academia, in journalism. So I, 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 I take it as a privilege that now and then I'm called upon to defend new thought because I do believe in its principles and uh, identify with the people who seek within its uh, parameters and they're not heard very much in the media so if I can play that role from time to time that's a privilege. Yeah and I, I personally had had that experience where I kind of have two ex extremes among my friends right it's a uh, um, atheist leftists who probably work in something related to the arts or online media, right? And then it's a bunch of esoteric uh, weirdos and Buddhists, right? So those those are my, my friend groups. And I've had the personal experience of hearing both of these very divergent uh, uh, groups sort of knock new thought. So, I mean, that's exactly what you said, but I've personally yeah. experienced it, yeah. Um, so if, if new thought, if positive thinking is kind of the, the secret religion of America, why... America's a little sad right now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> why? You're way fucked up. <laughs> it's yeah, not works. It it's is, it's actually the secret religion of America. Why is America kind of falling on maybe hard times? Oh, falling on what? On, on kind of hard times. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting question. Um, 
there's terrible divisiveness uh, in our society right now, and I don't know where this polarity is going to end. You know, one of the ideas that, that emanates from within New Age culture that I disagree with, there's many, many things on the New Age in which I'm in deep sympathy. The idea of a body-mind connection and health, uh, again, the idea that thoughts are causative, the idea that you can search for spiritual fulfillment uh, outside of any established faith. There's many, many principles of the New Thought culture that I identify with very deeply, and I make a list of five of them at the end of A Cult America. Warning. Audio issues ahead. The one that I disagree with very strongly is this idea that consciousness is evolving, that we're somehow moving into higher, higher mm -hmm. states of consciousness. I see no evidence for that anywhere. What I see is a tremendous polarity that we in the availability of different kinds of spiritual thought, the opportunity for the individual to search, the expansion of our spiritual and therapeutic vocabulary. Those are wonderful, wonderful things. At the same time, I see a reversion to tribalism, a reversion to a very dominant us versus them thinking of our language thanks to digital discourse. Sarcasm is now the everyday tongue of the digital culture. Rhetorical questions, virtue postures, these are things that online discourse, uh, you know, discounting sports scores, porn, and weather. Once you get to sports, porn, and the weather, everything questions and virtue and it's it's dividing us terribly human nature has to change but the connectedness that a lot of people thought would foster new understanding has fostered contempt we are kind of pressed up against one another 24 7 and it fosters terrible friction so you really get down to concrete observation I see no so no evidence other than, you know, very ponderous statements you know, that humanity's consciousness is somehow developed or evolved. I see terrible devices. Maybe that's a natural law. Maybe that's a natural. Maybe with the expansion of this connectedness comes friction. Maybe with expanded awareness, friction. I mean, look. Proximity didn't make Cain and Abel love one another more. You know, yep. Cain was nagging Cain to worship like he did. Cain revolted against him and committed probably an unintentional act of fratricide. But yep. with awareness, with the eating of the apple from the tree of knowledge, Cain greater agency and greater awareness, but also friction. No longer automatons that were dancing free like little fawns through the garden gardens. We were people who had points of view. Or perspective under it may be with that perspective inevitably becomes petition and a push up. So there we enter wonderful. We all will be able to talk to one another and the folks watching with us this wonderful digital technology. But we'll sign off and go back to our lives in such a period of time and we'll find that, you know, somebody cursed us out because we posted a picture of puppies that they don't like. But something yes. they don't like. That too gets born of this familiarity. So there's two it may be a natural consequence of crime. Without question. I mean, people say, oh, you know, nature is constant, and it certainly is. But without question, I think this digital proximity has created deeper divisions in our country. I'm 52 years old. Things are definitely different today than what I recall as a child. And what I recall as a young man during the Reagan. Of course, this affected at people of different political perspectives all throughout my, my youth and earlier in 
Volta, but nothing like it. Nothing like it. Yes. Of course. And we have to change. But like the able to we have different ideas. And possibly your fratricide is what's been raised. I, I hope not literally, but you know, the friction is certainly there. So uh, I think that it may be a natural consequence of interconnectedness and we are going to have to learn to navigate it, which is why some of our sophisticated friends could be learning the lessons of a book like uh, How to Win Friends in the Art, which educated people hold their eyes up. Figures like Del Carnegie and Napoleon Hill were brilliant and shrewd observers of human nature. They helped people navigate the transition from an agricultural economy into an industrial or sales-based economy. We need that help to navigate the transition from an industrial economy to a digital economy. It's not enough. The fact that sarcasm is the ordinary language of digital life yeah. is a grave problem. Sarcasm is supposed to be an exception. Of our discourse and the language of hostility to a great extent. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's really funny because, you know, that's actually something my wife and I talk about, and people have probably already noticed whether this is the first show that they've watched or, or a million, even in very serious um, topics uh, like religion. You know, I often default to sarcasm, and, you know, I'm a child of the 90s where, of course, it, it really came. Came to be the uh, the mainstream way of of uh, of communicating and indicating humor. Right. Uh, now I actually do like. Oh, sarcasm is a lot funnier when it's rarer. But I, I can see. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, but I can see how online, how you know, so, something that is, that is relatively harmless is of course mutated into into a horrible monster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so do you think that we need a new like do we need a new Napoleon Hill or, or a new Dale Carnegie to come 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 along and tell us, you know, to make this transition? Desperately. Absolutely desperately. Yeah. It's funny, about uh, oh, I don't know, maybe nine months ago I did a live stream at the Washington Post uh, to talk about the eightieth anniversary of Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the book review editor there, Ron Charles, I think was pleasantly surprised that the discussion, instead of conducted along the lines of, oh, you know, isn't it a shame that this snake oil is still persistent in American life? Doesn't it just say something about the withering of the American intellect? You know, the American intellect has been withering for so long, you would wonder, you know, where was the golden age where everything was fun? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but my take is actually, we need to relearn these lessons. These guys... Understood by the early New Thought pioneers, the early motivational pioneers, they understood how to get things done inside of organizations. They understood how to persuade other people of your point of view without persuading. How to natural resources in ways other than fear. They were very, very shrewd psychological observers, and we are going to have to relearn those lessons because our current modus operandi is, is, is not working, as you were saying. Yeah. Sarcasm is funny when it's accepted. Yeah. When it's omnipotent. And we have to learn to be talking to one another online. I mean, I am I am shocked. Even though I probably shouldn't be. I, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. There are people, and I'm sure you guys have had this experience. I'm sure many people also have had this experience. People for whom you've done favors, you know, people who you've helped move, people whose cat rescued out of trees. You'll post something, you know, that they don't like, often political. They just go crazy in the most vociferous language. And it's not limited to the right. We've all had everybody has a mental picture of this for whom we've done favors, helped out, been there for in a town, whatever. We post something from the left, right, doesn't matter. They don't like it, and they blame us online. That's a great thing. You know, of relationships. They wouldn't do that in person because there's some healthy business that we experience when we're dealing with people face to face. Right? The wrong word. There's a greater intake of information. Information leakage when we're at the remove of digital. People can't respond to us right away. We have fantasy of anonymity in a certain sense. And 
so we do, we say things that or, or, ordinarily we would have enough information. And so to, to, to speak directly to your question, we are in desperate of a new, you know, Carnegie or, or, or Napoleon Hill or someone like that who can reword as to how to work in this case. Uh, the current method's not working. Yeah. Speaking of breaking down, uh, I apologize about the audio. It looks like we're losing about 10% of everything that you're saying. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, on my end. So um, I'm, I'll sit closer. Uh, maybe. I, uh, I think it's just the connection. We'll keep going. I think that we're getting the gist. Um, and, and maybe we'll just have a, a part two later on. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go into a little more detail. But... Um, <clears throat> I, I did want to ask you, um, you've talked about the New Age, and um, as we are a, a Gnostic show, um, where do you think the connections are between the New Age and Gnosticism, either in the past or in its modern incarnation? Well, that's a great question, actually. I have a paper coming out uh, in an anthology that Brill is publishing, the, the academic press on Gnosticism in America. I think that the Gnostics and the New Agers have no direct family tree of connection. I mean, you know, one must always be very careful about tracing historical connections because ideas get lost, they go underground, they seem to be discontinued for a time, then they revive. Uh, other new ideas emerge that compare well with ancient or older ideas. And I think that probably the chief point of comparison between Gnosticism and New Age is a kind of radical ecumenism. The, not, the ancient Gnostics were unsettled. They were great seekers. They didn't belong to any one particular church, uh, doctrine, government approved, religion, state, ideology, uh, established temple order. They were wonderfully and radically ecumenical in their way. The New Age folk are the same way today. They, they really exist outside the walls of any one congregation, doctrine, temple, dogma. And that searching kind of pisses people off sometimes because they feel it connotes a lack of seriousness. Yeah. Critics call it cafeteria religion. But my response to that is, so what? So what? You know, humanity has been practicing so-called cafeteria religion from the dawn of history. The Romans would conquer a new territory, and no sooner would they conquer it than they'd begin to adopt or, or, or form composites of the gods that they discovered in that new territory with their own. That's how Persian ideas traveled west, Western ideas traveled east, vice versa. There's all kinds of things that we wouldn't have in the, our modern world and in our religions, including our traditional religions, if it weren't for the intrinsically syncretic qualities of religions. We all know that you can look at Judeo-Christian holidays and peg them to certain ancient pagan holidays. Uh, there was a much greater awareness of astrology, for example, within ancient Judaism than there is today, but the connection was certainly felt. There are many Jewish elements as well as Greek-Egyptian elements in Christianity. Religions have always been syncretic. So to me, if somebody wants to call me a purveyor of cafeteria religion, they're very welcome to. It's not a label I would, I would flee from. In fact, that combinative syncretic quality is one of the things I really value in the New Age. My approach my attitude is, you know, don't strangle an experiment before it's come to fruition. Let's see where the experiment goes. Hinduism has traveled to the West. It's going to morph and, and, and combine itself with certain Western elements that might produce things that a person likes, that might produce things that a person doesn't like. But that experiment is inevitable. It's human. Uh, and I, I value, I tremendously value the religious syncretism and, and, and radical ecumenism of the New Age. Yeah. Um, where, where do you see like major points of divergence between sort of the New Age and Gnosticism? Where would you say that they might disagree? Well, you know, some of the Gnostics, of course, had a certain apocalypse. I think that was probably a carryover from the Hebrews. Uh, the New Agers don't really have an apocalypse. In fact, you know, as I was saying earlier, there tends to be, broadly speaking, uh, a belief that I think is unsupported in the evolution of consciousness. Yeah. Um, I think probably, obviously, due to, due to a, a difference in, in the times that we live in, the New Agers have a tremendous 
a variety of things to draw upon, including uh, physical modalities. So there's, there's that facet of New Age thought. And one facet of New Age thought that I've become very, very concerned about, and that certainly differs from the past, uh, because it's particular to our time, is the growth of conspiracism within New Age thought. And I'm very, very yeah. concerned about that. Uh, some New Age folk uh, have taken ideas from Gnosticism about adversarial forces, and they've cut and pasted them into our 21st century era, and they foster a great deal of paranoia, political conspiracy, financial conspiracy, all of it false, all of it misleading, all of it fomenting a very viscerally satisfying um, but anger-based us versus them mentality. And I'm very, very concerned about how certain contemporary so-called spiritual thinkers will take concepts of archons, for example, or concepts of negative or opposing forces, and they will combine those with a kind of uh, angry, childish populism. Yeah. And from that, we'll create a, a conspiratorial worldview, which inevitably travels into a bigoted us versus them uh, direction, and actually does uh, siphon off people's appropriate outrage about unaccountability in our financial institutions, in our government, and makes it into a kind of uh, very misdirected, topsy-turvy, childish, false passion play in which the individual, who's always the good guy, is, is, is facing down these negative forces. And it's the exact opposite of the spiritual search because it directs people away from looking in the mirror at their own faults, their own problems of conduct, their own addictions, their own relationship failures. All these people who uh, foment conspiracist thoughts seem to look everywhere but in the mirror. Yeah, Where? and it somehow always winds up with the uh, protocols of the elders of Zion. Somehow, oh, I... all conspiracist thought leads towards anti-Semitism and yes. bigotry. At the end of the day, at mm -hmm. the end of the day, if you follow that thread, it always goes back to the protocols, Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism, and broad-based forms of bigotry, and always directs the gaze of the misdirected seeker away from the mirror, away from his or herself. Know thyself becomes topsy-turvy. It really becomes know thy enemy. And it mm. distracts people in this intoxicating way from considering themselves, their own lives, their own relationships. How does your spouse regard you? How does your uh, close friends regard you? How do your neighbors regard you? Are you seen as helpful, beneficent, generous? Are you sure? Because that's the very place that the seeker needs to start looking, and that's the very last place that uh, the conspiracist New Age directs people to. It's uh, a, 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 a topsy-turvy reversal. It's the opposite of, of the search. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's something, again, um, outside of just ideas, it's something that Father Tony and I have run into in the real world, right? I, I have a, like a a Gnostic study group here, and I once had uh, somebody who was pretty into conspiracies come, and we had a, uh, a reporter uh, who's a friend, she wasn't there to report on it, but who was, you know, interested in Gnosticism, who came, who works for our, our uh, public broadcasting uh, up here, and, you know, he got into a very large, very big fight with her, just, you know, letting her know that her bosses are actually lizard people, right? And she, she disagreed that her bosses are, are literal uh, <laughs> lizard people. Uh, and we also get, you know, we also get it online, and Father Tony gets some interesting emails and stuff. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, and for the watchers and listeners at home, we, we've actually done a few a few shows on the topic. We we did one with our for Goldweg, and that is, you know, he really does trace. It, it, at the end of the day, it always ends up back in in anti-Semitism. Oh, <laughs> so, and, yeah. and another you know facet that you can always detect in this conspiracist thought is the other party is never wrong, is never mistaken, has yeah. never made a mistake. They're intentionally misleading you. They're intentionally misleading you. you know, right. it's like if I leave someone out of my litany of new thought heroes or some aspect of occult history gets omitted in some history that I'm talking about somewhere, it's impossible for these folk to imagine that, well, Horowitz made a mistake or yeah. Horowitz is just wrong or Horowitz omitted something because there's only so much time on the clock. It's always, this is an intentional misleading of people. You know, everything is purposeful. Everything is purposeful. And uh, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's encroaching 
deeply into New Age culture, and it's a serious concern. Yeah. Well, we could go on and on about that. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> let, let's uh, start to wrap things up here with a couple of questions that um, I find particularly interesting, and one conversation I've had uh, a number of times with other uh, occultists uh, is this idea that, and you alluded to it earlier, that there is this kind of spiritual ladder uh, of consciousness that society, that humanity, that uh, everybody will climb and then at some point utopia, I guess. Yeah. Um, do you think that there are uh, hard limits on human spiritual potential or do you think that um, there is this kind of infinite uh growth to the divine that is possible that's a really heavy and interesting question (laughs) the idealized answer that i'd like to give you is of course there are no limits you know we're children of the divine and we could climb up jacob's ladder as far as 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 the highest exists and and the highest being infinite so uh you know i'd like to give that idealistic answer but the fact is i think we do function under serious limitations. And I say that because having been on the path for many, many years, I can identify no one, actually, who I would say was a realized person. And I can identify people who I think had traits of realization, who also had grave and sometimes equally countervailing flaws. So our philosophies have to be achievable philosophies. They, 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 they have to be achievable I, I think we need ideals, of course, and we need a North Star, but we also need things that are going to be applicable next Thursday. And right. I do think we function under very grave limits, which is a part of Gnostic thought that I really value because the Gnostics really asked very tough questions about why, why, if we're under the uh, reign of this beneficent monotheistic creator, there is such sorrow and division and violence in the world. And they came up with a variety of answers to that, that reflected on the blindness, the illusion, the limitations of present uh, human existence. I'd like to say that we can climb all the way up Jacob's ladder. I'd like to say that. But I think we, we live within a cosmic framework, within a material framework that's apparently very, very limiting. Uh, I have a friend who's an enormously gifted and brilliant martial artist, and he's been around a lot of traditional martial arts and Zen masters in Japan and elsewhere who function under traditional hierarchical systems of development. And I asked him, have you ever met someone you felt was a developed or realized person? And he said simply, no, no. And that's comported with my own experience. We can't resort to fantasy about this. You know, I'm, I'm going to get emails from people who say, well, you know, my neighbor Mike is realized, or I've been a teacher who's realized, and I would take some time. Those to- aren't the emails you're going to get. You're going to get the emails that say, I am realized. Yeah, here's I, what- right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you could become my student, yeah. <laughs> you know, or what have you. Yeah. yeah, I am realized. And I would take some very serious time with that. I would take some very serious time with that, because I've never – met anyone who I thought was either realized in, you know, according to whatever terms you define it, or didn't have equal and countervailing flaws to whatever development they had experienced. And I think one should really, really sit with that. Yeah. Um, I guess we are wrapping it up, huh, Father Tony? So, so I should better yeah. skip to the last last question. Yeah, Talking about the softball. Yeah, yeah. That, it, it's a good one. It's, it um, a good one. Oh, good uh, one. So, yeah, dude, softballs are good. Yeah. Uh, we rarely throw hardballs at our guests, actually. Ah, so, uh, welcome in, please. Yeah, but uh, it actually does tie in really deeply with practical esotericism. Yeah, before. please. please. Because I, I've been thinking a lot about the connections with, between creativity, art, <laughs> and esoteric thought. And, you know, we have uh, sort of in our Gnostic movement, we, we have roots going back to uh, Belle Epoque, France, right? Late, late 1800s of uh, 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 Paris, where a lot of people involved with, with uh, Gnosticism were also involved with, with art. So yeah. what, what do you consider a mind-blowing piece of occult art? Anything, you know, a movie, a book, music? What a wonderful question. What do I consider a mind-blowing piece of occult art? Well, uh, I'll name something quite recent that was mind-blowing for me. Uh, the filmmaker M. Night Shyamalan made a film... Um, Oh, gosh, the name is suddenly escaping me. Split. Split. One of his most recent movies. It was about a figure with 
uh, 30 some odd split personalities and one of these personalities which was very fearsome emerged at the end and the protagonist uttered the line we are what we think we are we are what we think we are and I thought this was the only new thought themed horror movie that I had ever seen and I thought it was a brilliant piece of art and I say that because I think it's going to attain some posterity I really love M. Night Shyamalan's work and when he succeeds, he succeeds brilliantly. When he fails, he fails brilliantly. I'm a big fan of his, and I, 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 I part ways with his detractors. I think he, he's an extraordinary filmmaker on par with Hitchcock. And so that's something very recent that touched me. I probably watched that movie about three times. Um, I just found it horrifying and idealistic and interesting and thoughtful. And ultimately, it was the only horror movie that I could ever say was a, a motivating influence of sorts in my life. Maybe Rosemary's Baby as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I think M. Night Shyamalan's movie, um, Split, is, uh, is, is, is worth watching. Enormously provocative and moving. It was a real experience for me. Yes. Yeah, that was a good one. I, I agree with you. I think that his, uh, his successes are fantastic and his failures are also equally fantastic. Yeah, yeah I like Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, your website is MitchHorowitz.com, um, Occult America, great book. Um, it, uh, uh, one, um, sorry, I'm blanking on One Simple other. Idea. One, one Simple Idea, thank you. Yeah. And uh, The Miracle Club, your new the book. The Miracle Club is coming out in the month of October, yeah. and that's a very special book to me because that's a really practical, hands-on book in terms of mind power methods. So if somebody really wants to get down into the guts of things and try practical methods, The Miracle Club is a, is a wonderful book to check out. That can be pre-ordered. It's coming out from Inner Traditions in October. That's what? fantastic. All right, looking forward to that. Yeah. Oh, wait for for one for one final plug, uh, Father Tony. I realized we didn't give any context to Mitch or the audience for my title of King of the Gnostics. Uh, <laughs> that's that's the nickname bestowed upon me by uh, by a very excellent podcast named Apocrypha House. Uh, with Benito Serino and Chris Sims, actually two professional comic book writers and uh, writers uh, of other things, writers. Um, and they're uh, reading, uh, each episode is either a book of the Bible or uh, an uh, apocryphal text. Um, and it's uh, it's great for no matter what your interests, uh, whether you're 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 a big religion nerd like us, or uh, you're an atheist, or whatever, because uh, it's very entertaining. Uh, it's academically rigorous at the same time. There's a lot of great po pop culture comparisons that really uh, allow one to to understand the text. And uh, I don't know them personally, but we've had Benito on the the show, um, so check out our, our Christmas show with uh, Benito Serino. And I harassed him on Twitter. So so uh, occasionally they 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 mentioned me on the show and it was out that 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 wonderful nickname. But uh, check them out. The yes, def definitely. That's a recommend for me also. It's, <laughs> yes. it's, been a, it's a fun podcast. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you everybody, and uh, for all of us here at the Kingsman, uh, we will see you. Uh, I guess next time we record, which should be soon and more frequently. And thank you again, Mitch. Uh, it was, it's thank always you. a pleasure to see you. And, uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.